What up, what up? My, uh, my setup is a little bit janky at the moment, so it's going to roll with it. Hopefully the audio is coming through okay. And then um, I'm also messing around with a stream goal thing for anybody who wants to do super chat. Um, that'll go immediately to trying to get some new concept art. That being said, we are going to jump right into designing a TTRPG. Actually, no, give me just a minute. moment. Okie dokie. Cool. Uh, ugh, man. The uh, the font on the stream elements thing. Don't really like that. You can't really read the chat at all. Okay, well, I feel like that might be a problem for a later time. Hello. All right, I'll, I'll try to keep the mic a little bit closer to my mouth so that it's not so quiet, but... Um, I'm a pretty soft-spoken person in general, so that tends to be the main problem. But let's jump in. Oh no, okay. Well, I'm gonna disable the stream elements thing for now, but uh, probably get to it later. So hey there folks, Rel here. Uh, we are gonna be walking through designing a tabletop role-playing game from scratch. You can ask any sorts of questions that you might have about this particular process. I'm up to my elbows in it, starting from nothing. So, you know, I uh, have a lot of experience in the games industry, but none in the TTRPG space outside of just playing games uh, with with folks who primarily play D&D. &D. And, and even then, I would say that I'm not super well versed in, in the the wonderful world of TTRPGs in general. So if you're looking for somebody who has uh, qualifications, that's uh, that's not me. But what I can say is that uh, I've done a lot of really awesome stuff so far and have uh, learned this whole process just by the act of doing it, which should speak to the fact that it's not actually that difficult to do. It's difficult to make money from. I think that's the distinction. So we're going to jump right into, uh, I guess, some bullet points that I had lined up. A lot of this is it's about designing a TTRPG, but quite honestly, it, it affects every aspect of creation when it comes to a, a personal, like a passion project that you plan on sharing with a broader audience. A lot of these same elements will, will end up here. So first, we're just going to start with, uh, with planning. So... Oh, hey, thank you, Wode. It's very nice. And also, thank you, uh, some of the, the new folks here. Awesome. Cool. Yeah, let's do a little, little streamy chat thing. So hopefully that'll update. But anyhow, so yes. Oh, man, okay. Now I, I really want chat up just so that folks can see. But the text is so bad. <laughs> I, need to, I need to make it uh, white. Since we're on a black background, um, yeah, well, I'm still learning. Things are trying to. I'm trying to elevate this process as we as we move through. But all right, so let's talk about designing uh, a TTRPG. The first thing that you have to ask is, what's your goal? And this is any time that you're designing anything, it's important to take a step back and figure out exactly what you want to do 
with uh, what, what you want to invest your time in and what you're looking to get out of that process. So if I'm writing a book, for example, if it's just for me because I, I want a creative outlet, then that's totally fine. If it's something that you want to put in front of other people, oh, there it goes. If you want, um, if it's something that you want to put in front of other people, there are, uh, there are other considerations to make. First of which is, uh, who's your audience? Uh, who are you writing or creating for? Another one down here. Uh, who are your competitors? What are your personal limitations? As in, what uh, experience do you have that you can then uh, take with you into the the project that you're beginning on? And then the last one is uh, probably the most important. Why should anybody care? So, let's start from the top. Goals, just to give you an example. If I say uh, a goal, and this is not how I started developing Distal, which is my TTRPG, but if you're beginning a, a project, one of your goals can be like, um, I want to create a, a game in a system that I'm familiar with, so like a, a dice system that I'm familiar with, and I want it to have a heavy focus on you maybe it's a it's a super military style uh, game and I I want to be able to you know make a little bit of money off of it because it's a commercial production or I shouldn't even say a little bit of money maybe you want to make buckets and buckets of money if those are your goals just to to write them so let's as a thought experiment I want to make a, a military uh, let's say let's say a hardcore military themed I'm still going to use fantasy because it's um, a game so let's say that uh, let's say that we're, we're all going to be knights and this is my my big concept uh, nice of the round sure I guess well that's not really military fantasy okay we're going to be knights in a medieval army okay and that's like the, the theme of my game. That's one of my goals, what I want to pursue. And then let's say uh, I want to be able to sell it for the monies. Uh, that could be a goal too, which caveat here, making something to make money should never be, that should never be the goal. It is a, it is a result of the value that you're providing to others. So you have to make a product that is desirable, that fills ideally fills a niche, and have people willing to to pay for it. So uh, this is more of a like this would be like a personal goal opposed to a, a goal for the uh, for what you're creating. And then uh, let's say that um, my goals are uh, I only want to work on it during my off time. And that could be just a, a limitation even. If I copy and paste that one down here. Um, that's a limitation that you might have on the ability to commit time to the process of creating. Uh, one thing that you have to ask is, who's your audience? So the audience for this particular game might be, uh, let's see, people who want to... Uh, role play Arthurian uh, fantasy and yeah I don't think that's that's been done a whole lot there's um uh, pen dragon is an RPG that, that came out but my point here is that you want to know that you have an audience and then cater to that particular audience which also means knowing what that audience is uh, expects what their expectations are. So, uh, and we'll say that our competitor for this would be like Pendragon RPG. Um, I don't think it's actually called that, but it's Pendragon. So if you know that, if you know what your uh, intended niche is, then you can more easily narrow your design on a, uh, or narrow in on the type of design rather the uh, the gap that you can fill in the market. So for example, um, Pendragon is, it is Arthur, I don't know that much about the game. Um, it's Arthurian fantasy. You start as, I think you start as kids, like like knight, 
um, what do you call the, it's not knight errant, or is it? I can't remember. But the, the wannabe knights, uh, people who are apprenticing other, other knights. Anyway, I think that's how you start, and then you end up becoming uh, something greater. So maybe that's not uh, a concept that a lot of people have, or rather, maybe that's not the concept that you want to entertain. And you say, okay, well, there's a gap in the market for um, for people who are just thrown into to heavy... Con it's Squire. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Um, maybe you, you you just want to throw people right into the thick of of the military aspect of it. So we'll say um, our audience is... Uh, uh, we'll say combat... Or, uh, people who enjoy a combat heavy experience and maybe then we can make a determination um to say like should it be gritty or should it be more fluffy or softer um but we'll say that it's uh it's going to be like more time uh levels of gritty so you're, you're cleaving appendages and that sort of thing and that's just a big part of your experience that game it honestly probably exists somewhere i have to I have a hard time imagining that that doesn't exist, but being able to point to something that you think is a gap in the market. And again, do you do your research? You have to know who your audience is and how much of them there are, uh, but that would be where you start. So we're going to bounce off this a little bit. Um, all of these bullets all kind of take place at the same time, even though the planning you'd assume takes place at the start. What's going to happen is that you're constantly adjusting your concept based on new information that uh, that is revealed, like if the landscape changes. For example, if I um, if I told you at the start of this year in January that uh, you know Wizards of the Coast they do their whole OGL thing and and really just push everybody to create their own game, if I would have told you that I wanted to create a tactical uh, what is it? Tactical, heroic, cinematic fantasy? Is that it? Um, I can't remember the, the the four bullets of MCDM's RPG. And then they would have announced that. I would have had to say like, oh, I got to change my idea. <laughs> you know, this uh, this competitor would have had, um, you know, has way more experience. They have um, a, a larger organization that, you know, a... Uh, a lot of clout within the industry, very popular. Um, if you were making the same thing, then it'd be like, what's the point? So uh, if you're making, again, this is if you wanted to to make a commercial product, you would have to address the existing uh, competition. So landscape can change. Um, and then so this last point right here, why should anybody care? This is a little bit difficult because you... Ideally, and I'm so sorry about the bouncing. This this current setup is just it's not really working for me. Um, why should anybody care? So you would want to make your game stand out, or I think solving a problem is probably an aspect that you can lean into when attempting to design anything. So in Planetside 2, that would be like um, if you... If you're designing your updates around things that people complain about, then it's easier to gain traction and approval for doing those particular updates. Um, yeah, maybe in, in hindsight, things don't really work out that well, but um, but as a basis for the development of something, that's a good place to start. So why should anybody care? Um, so if I said to you that I wanted to... Um, uh, just because this is easy for me, let's say that I want to point to the Dungeons and Dragons players, the ones who want a more gritty, grounded experience, and say, uh, death is, uh, or I'll say that um, it's a gritty experience, and death is more meaningful than 5e. Then I could say, uh, actually, I guess this kind of falls into to who's your audience, but this is how I could advertise the game. Um, I could say that, hey, if you like Dungeons and Dragons, but you really don't like the way that they do this mechanic, this mechanic, this mechanic, then maybe this is something that you should be interested or that you would, would be interested in. 
And that tends to be um, an approach that you can take. You wouldn't want to be so pointed, I feel, uh, at at a, an industry giant because those um, that sort of positioning can make you a target to a lot of people. For example, um, uh, and I, I feel this way about people who are like, oh, my game is so good and and like it solves all these problems. There's a particular system that I'm thinking of and, um, you know, bless your heart, but uh, the salesman sort of like style of, yeah, like this is the best way to do this thing. Like that's always wrong, objectively. TTRPGs are such a subjective experience to people that you never want to market yourself in such uh, a manner that maybe, maybe this is a personal gripe more than anything else. I hate it when people do the salesman stuff, the clickbaity stuff. It is a personal, it is a pet peeve of mine. And I find myself um, real, just, um, maybe I'm just disappointed in humanity because we fall for it so easily. Anyway, off topic. Let's move on down to developing. So the actual act of developing your game, how do you do it? There's a number of tools, some of which are free that you could take advantage of immediately. Uh, tools, let's say Google Docs. When you're writing a design document, start here. It's free. It uh, has great revision um, capabilities. I think it's a little bit too granular. Like they, they save the file so often that it can be difficult to find, um, like go back a few days and then try to get that revision. And, um, you know, if you want to copy and paste something from it, but anyway, uh, start with Google docs. If you look at the, the content that's, uh, or the alpha content that MCDM is putting out that. Uh, Tales of the Valiant is putting out that D&D 2024 is putting out. It's all two column black and white documents, not too much fancy there. And that's all you need to do. Personally, I have a hard time with it. Um, I really want my stuff to be fancy. And, uh, but that's for, for a later, a later challenge. So once you get to like the, the formatting process, um, Affinity Publisher, it's a good program, single purchase, unlike Adobe InDesign. So just real quick, um, I'm going to go to my big dumb face real quick and grab, I'm going to open up uh, Affinity just so I can show you how this, how this works. Not that I suggest it, not in the early stages, but it's so much better than InDesign for me. I picked it up so much more quickly than, um, than InDesign. It's way less finicky. There's some things I don't like about it, but all right, hold on. I got it up. Um, okay. Get you an early look. That's some of the stuff that's currently in development. So um, if we look at this, so this is Adobe, or Adobe, um, Affinity Publisher. Publishing software is different from a word processor. Word processor is Microsoft Word, Google Docs. Um, and those are really the programs that you want to use when you're trying to iterate quickly and just type up a bunch of stuff. I think I had like 130,000 words or maybe 180,000 words. It was something ridiculous in my Google Doc before I moved on to to Adobe. Um, I keep saying it, Affinity Publisher. But um, But I also don't need to be here. Like this is above and beyond what anybody needs to do in the alpha stages of the game. And I only did it because I'm, con I'm a contrarian <laughs> or really just because I really like when things look pretty and so I can see the vision. Like it feels like I'm, I'm creating something that um, is more digestible. 
uh, but realistically, it'll slow you down, especially if you're not used to this workflow. But this is a tool that either you need to learn or somebody else needs to learn, and then you need to work with them to, to format your document. And there are people out there who have a lot of experience in this who you can simply hire if you have the money. Uh, Home Brewery also works for making PDFs. Yeah, Owen, um, I think, what is it based on? Uh, HTML? Let me, let me go check real quick. Because that's a good call out. Home Brewery by Natural Crit. Um, give me just a moment. Yeah, so if I go back to, to this, this is going to be awful. Okay, I'm trying. I'm trying very hard not to dox myself at the same time. So let's. Okay, so basically, um, if you've seen uh, Dungeons and Dragons, uh, like rule books, this is the layout that they're using. Um, this is. You also, I don't think you're supposed to be using this trade dress, which is uh, like the font that's being used. Some of the uh, the specific um, underlines, the colors, the uh, the borders of certain boxes, and that sort of thing. I'm pretty sure that's copyrighted, but that only matters if you're trying to sell stuff. So um, this is a place that you can something that you can use for free. If you go to uh, homebrewery.naturalcrit.com, which I'll, I'll put down here too. Um, but you, the caveat is that you have to know HTML. I can't, I can't move all the way to the, to the right and I don't feel like, like doing it, but um, yeah, or actually it's not, it's not even HTML. I think it's, it's like markup mixed with HTML, but they do have guidelines for how to make use of it. Uh, and that, that would save you some time, especially if you're in the realm of making homebrew content specifically, which just to define it, um, homebrew is creating derivative content for another system that you can either just use for personal use or depending on the, the license, uh, sell it. So a lot of people make Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition homebrew and then make uh, a good living off of that because they're consistently coming up with, um, with new, you know, subclasses, adventures, settings, and, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's probably, honestly, that's probably where you should dip your toes into the water. If you're looking to create a, uh, a body of work, I guess, a portfolio of, um, just previous work so that you can kind of gain a little bit more confidence or rather show people these other things that you've, you've created to, to rally support. But let's move on to, uh, well, okay. So for tools real quick, this is for, excuse me. Um, this is for, for the actual development of the document. But if I had to, to give you like an order of operations, it'd be start with Google docs. Don't, don't not do Google Docs um, or, oh, okay, or um, Microsoft Word is fine too. Affinity Publisher for the, um, sure, why don't we just separate these into smarter categories. Uh, processors, uh, publishing software, which I guess I would, uh, include home brewery in that as well. Uh, but even for home brewery, like you'd want to have your stuff written out so that you can copy and paste the text in to your document. And then you just have to worry about the formatting after that. Uh, and then another thing that I wanted to touch on was actually character sheets. So, um, Canva is a, actually, here, start again. Google um, Sheets to, here, I'm going to, this will probably be good, but I'm going to try to not to dox myself again. Big dumb face. 
Uh, what am I writing in now? It's Notion. Yeah. Let's see. Let's go to uh, Google Sheets. I'm going to show you some, some like old, this is where I started when creating a character sheet for distal, if I could find it. Uh, it's so old. Where is it? This one? Cool. All right, hold on. Uh, I need, I need a better setup for, for this stuff, but it should be. No, I don't think so. Hold on. <laughs> I'm, I'm struggling. Okay. Um, this will be, this be good enough. All right. So if I go back to, here we go. Okay. So Google, uh, sheets also free Google suite of tools, which is, you know, awesome. This is how I made my character sheet, at least to start. So created a bunch of, um, rows or rows and columns of a specific size. I think I used like 21. And what that did was functionally create a grid for me. And then I go and I combine certain cells to, to create a, a larger cell. And then if I wanted to like, you know, fill it in or whatever, uh, or create fillable sheets, this is a good place to start. Um, when creating an, a character sheet, just kind of as a as an aside, um, Mark Perry, I'm going to, I'll get to that question. Uh, yeah, well, okay. So, and then, oh, and I started here and I'll show you how to, how to work through it after. So when creating a character sheet, you, you want to figure out what your, I, I think I'm, I'm skipping some steps in the TTRPG process, but you want to know what is the important information to, to surface to your, your players. Um, what do you want to emphasize? How much room do you need to give them? What stats are they consistently going to reference? And what is better served to be pushed somewhere else or on a totally separate page? So, um, you know, I, I rough this out, name, lineage, character level, class, health die, health bonus, um, you know, death marks, and then bigger boxes for defense because I wanted defense to be more prominent. It's just a big number that you put in there. Same with, thing with block and then durability. And then big numbers here for strength, dexterity, fortitude, whatever, just so that you can quickly identify them. One area that I think that this could be improved is that, and I, I like how MCBD, MCDM does uh, their attacks. Granted, they have less of them, but their character sheet has like three different vertical um, blocks for, for the attack and then just the additional information. I guess attack special abilities, something like that. Um, Whereas I have just like your weapon slash attack, you know, and it kind of just goes in order and that's fine. It's just not very prominent when oftentimes you want to know the two hit and then the, the damage, those are the two big points. And then the rest is kind of like, um, is a point of reference, but isn't what you're consistently looking at. So I, I think that there's some room to, to clean this up and I'm, I'm going to have to go through and create a new character sheet anyway, just because there's some stuff that's changing in uh, distal, but uh, so I created the character sheet here and then this is the accounting sheet, same thing. Um, it's a little outdated, but I don't use this anymore. And then I'm going to show you, I'm going to uh, switch off of this real quick and then go into Canva. So canva.com is free. There's a bunch of upsells, but they, um, it's a good way to, uh, let me find my projects. Okay, so I'll show you um, what I did here. 
All right, so check this out. So I'm in Canva right now. And what I did was just export the, actually, I wonder if it's, I think I deleted it. Um, I have, yeah, I think I deleted it. But what I did was export in Google Docs the, uh, like make a PDF of the sheet. And then I made a Canva um, that was the same size. And then I just used Canva's elements to, to plop them onto the page and then took some artistic, uh, you know, just had a little bit of um, uh, artistic flair with like some of the, the ways that those elements are represented on the, the sheet. But I used my Google Docs as a template for creating something that felt more solid. And then from this point, I export it again as PDF and then take that PDF into Adobe Acrobat or there's other websites too. And then you can block out all the individual cells and make them fillable and then export that as a PDF or rather save it, I guess, um, as a fillable PDF. And then that way you can have people insert their information right there. So this is a, it takes some, takes some doing, takes some artistic um, uh, experimentation and, and creativity, but as a starting point, this, this only took me, it's only took me like a, a day maybe um, to get what I have now. It took me longer to figure out how to make the thing fillable, but um, that was all areas of learning. All right, so I'm gonna go, I kill that too, but um, here I'll go back to Canva, or rather um, character sheets. So canva.com, uh, use this to, okay. Use this to flesh out your, actually, I guess, to conceptualize your sheets. Use this to make them pretty. All right, cool. Uh, let's see, so quick catch up on, on questions. Not that you can see it in the chat on the right all that well, but, um, Yeah, so uh, Mark Perry says, how does Distal differ from D&D and what style of game is it uh, designed to stimulate? So Distal is specifically meant to feel familiar to people who play Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition or 3.5 Edition or Pathfinder. Uh, and it retains that familiarity through, it's a D20 based system, it's very class focused. And how it differentiates itself is that it's a more grounded experience. It uh, has its own setting, which is still being developed. Uh, there's a whole lot of work on the, the lore side of things that need to be that needs to be completed. Um, and then uh, all the, the rule sets are totally, it's totally different. Um, it is a unique system. It's not a derivative. It has, uh, it combines a lot of concepts from, uh, from like fourth edition I think, and then a lot of stuff that, because I don't have a whole lot of experience with TTRPGs. Uh, I started with 3.5 fifth edition and then uh, played a lot of fifth edition. I know about other TTRPGs, but I'm still like learning a lot. So a lot of the stuff that I've developed was um, it's to solve problems or rather things that I don't like about, yeah, things that I think could be done differently in D&D to, uh, to cater to my particular tastes. So actually I'm going to, Try to find the, um, I have a hit sheet somewhere for, that talks about all of the, uh, the different aspects of it. And it'll just be easier for me to go through that. So here, I'll show it up on screen. All right, so check this out. Um, this is the, the alpha test document, the, the one that's currently in progress, or progress. I think that a lot of the stuff is still there too. But uh, for themes, you know, Distill is meant to be a grounded but not gritty fantasy world. Your past experiences, hardships, trauma will have built you into the person that you are today. These themes dip into dark places on occasion, but are mostly implied instead of overt. Uh, mechanical differences. This is where things are set apart uh, a great deal. You write your background via prompts, which is a super fun process, by the way. Uh, most of the people that I talk to really dig it. 
So actually everybody that I talked to really digs it, uh, which has been awesome. And uh, this latest version of the game is going to kind of make that a little bit more prominent. But so you write your background via prompts. Uh, every brush with death brings you closer to this sweet forever sleep. That is to say that when you begin dying or your health drops to zero, uh, you accumulate death marks. And those are permanent marks against your character. When you reach enough of them, you're dead forever. That's that's it. And the the goal is a, a number of things. You want to, and at least in this particular game, I want to make sure that the players uh, aren't just picking you back up. That is not a thing that should happen. It's not something that I like about 5th edition Dungeons, Dungeons and Dragons. I don't like that it's uh, more efficient to wait for somebody to go down and then give them one point of health than it is to prevent them from dying in the first place because, quite frankly, dying should be a traumatic experience that you try to avoid. Um, though in D&D, they, they phrase it as unconscious, even though you're you're pretty close to, um, to getting KO'd forever. Uh, so this, through the death marks just being accumulated over time, you are... It's going to shape how your character goes to the, through the world. And there's actually, in the next version, going to be some some benefits and detriments that you get from that, aside from just ticks against your character. And there's also some mechanics that um, interplay with, with death kind of in general in this game. Uh, there's also no resurrection spells. It's If you wanted to homebrew it or put something in the game, it is a reasonable, uh, it's reasonable that in this world that sort of thing could work. But uh, but by default, there are none. Stabilized characters take time to recover. Weapon and spellcasting capabilities rank up independently of your character's core attributes. So you basically you have proficiencies for different types of, of weapons, and you can rank those up. Um, and you uh, but the damage or like that changes your two hit values, and then your uh, damage is modified by what type of weapon it is um, or what attribute it's associated with. So for example, you have strength weapons, you have dexterity weapons, you have intelligence-based weapons, you have some that are hybrid, a mixture of both, and um, that would change your damage output. But when it comes to actually using weapons, it's just, it's a matter of preference, and then you rank them up as skills independently. Same thing with um, your your skills. So stealth, uh, perception, mage work, uh, influence, engineering, that sort of thing those are separate from your attributes. So you don't need to play a dexterity character to be stealthy. You don't need to uh, play an intelligence character to have an understanding of magic. Um, let's see. And then there's... So classes are a big focus of this, this game, and they're they're grounded in the, the lore of the world, so they have a reason for being most often. And uh, And they're also not limited to a strict role archetype if you want to uh play let's say that there's like a like a paladin style class that exists within the game there are some abilities that kind of re revolve around using a shield but you really don't need to play it that way uh, in fact you can play it like kind of as a caster if you really wanted to if you wanted to kind of lean more toward a like an inquisitor style gameplay you could totally do that lots of options and then they have kind of branching options later. Every third level, you get a signature, which is one of three options. And then every two levels, you have what are essentially feats that allow you to diverse, uh, diversify a character more. Um, the weapon arsenal is diverse and specific. It's very... Um, there's a lot of different properties, a lot of different uh, damage styles. And then, um, and everything is mostly meant to be balanced around itself. So you don't have like, oh, this is just a strictly better weapon. It doesn't really exist within this game. It's more preference. Uh, willpower is a limited resource, which we don't need to talk about. Um, and then animal companions have plot armor. There's, there's ways to protect your animals from dying in this game. Uh, classes are asymmetric. They both have mechanic and ability differences. Yes. They, yes, they're, they're very different um so like all the spellcasters and i'm trying I'm trying not to derail this too much but all the uh actually mark if you want to go download the the core rules they're totally free so um if you want to just download the pdf and, and take a look you can 
do that on uh, playdisrpg.com or distalrpg.com. And uh, you could just thumb through it all. There's there's a whole lot there. It's a full system that's fully playable, despite being an alpha, because a lot of things are still changing. You're still getting a lot of feedback and kind of uh, iterating on things. But when it comes to the playability of the game, yeah, like you can roll up characters. It's super fun. And uh, and you could start having adventures. I, I really appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Cool. So let's uh, go back to, okay, so you created character sheets, potentially, um, you know, publishing software we talked about, word processors we talked about, uh, tools. When it comes to art, art is a tricky concept or topic rather. And, you know, you can always use, uh, let's see. So when it comes to art, if you have a knack for art, then I don't need to tell you any of this stuff. Photoshop, um, Currently, I have a Creative Cloud license. I've had it for years. It's $50 a month, which is way too much. <laughs> um, there are free alternatives to Photoshop. Uh, like um, GIMP is a uh, free Photoshop alternative. And there's a bunch of other stuff or others out there too. I can't think of any off the top of my head, but I, I stumble across them all the time. Uh, the reason that you would want to do art is... I would say, um, yeah, if you have a particular talent for it, that is something that can can very quickly, um, art just makes it easier to latch onto an idea than words on page. And just to kind of back up a little bit too, when you're developing something, and I, I'm super guilty of this, but when you're developing anything, you want to make sure that you lead with the, with the audience's heart, with their emotion. You want to get them invested uh, on, a, on a felt level before you start talking about mechanics because mechanics are very difficult to, to get people on board with unless they, unless they know exactly what they want. But a lot of people don't. So if you're trying to find an audience for a game, actually, I should probably talk about this in the communicating section, but... Um, you try to, to engineer your prod, uh, product in such a way that people understand the purpose behind it. And I say that I'm guilty of this because that's not where I started. I knew what I wanted to make and it wasn't for, it wasn't a commercial project. It was just for friends who already are on kind of like a similar wavelength. We all have our own opinions on how D and D, uh, could be different, and we all homebrew those sorts of things into our games already. So when it came to creating something, that's where I started. If you're doing something as a commercial project, don't start there. Start with the things that we talked about. Start with the planning and the targeting a niche, the, the goal setting. And then, uh, then you can kind of narrow in on a USP and why people should care at that point. Um, anyway, to get back to art, that's is one of those things that can kind of touch people on uh, an emotional level because they can see, uh, like a lot is conveyed through a picture. You can see how gritty a system is supposed to be. You can see uh, what type of fantasy they live within because fantasy is all over the place. Uh, so if you can commission um, art, it's, it's worth doing, but only if you have money. That's, that's the thing that I'm struggling with. Um, and you know, you see my, my tip goal here at the top where it's also, thank you again, Wode. Um, it's so freaking helpful. Um, art is, it's super expensive unless you know people who are in that space. Um, or if you're doing, uh, actually you can, you can find people who, who will do art more cheaply. Um, if you go to Fiverr, it's a good place to look, except you might not get the quality that you're going for. Um, it may also not be necessary to get quality early on either. And then to talk about it, uh, you have AI uh, generation. 
this is this is such a tricky topic right now um, because in this particular so AI in general is in a weird place where I hope that everybody understands that this is where the future is going. AI is a tool that is not going away. You're not putting that back in Pandora's box or closing Pandora's box rather. It's here to stay. So the decisions that we have to make about it are uh, we need to figure out, and this is all like uncharted waters. We need to figure out how much we, um, where we stand on the ethics of it, which if, if open AI was like, you know, doing all this stuff above board or like scraping a bunch of, you know, data and, uh, doing that, like with people's permission and understanding, we wouldn't even be here right now. Well, maybe, I don't know. Who knows? The world is weird. But in this particular industry, TTRPG space, you see conversations about this all the time. It is very undesirable to use AI art. Um, more acceptable in other places, but when it comes to any any um, sphere that has such a heavy presence with artists whose livelihood depends on that sort of work, uh, you're definitely going to get a lot of witch hunting when it comes to like, ah, oh, is this AI generated? Like, oh, that's, you know, trash or like, I don't like this project or product or whatever, like anything that you might be creating. Um, using AI generated art might just totally turn somebody off to it because we're all still developing stances and people have pretty strong ones and it's kind of all over the board. So um, personally, I use AI generated art for the uh well none of this project is being sold and i'm just like using it for placeholder pieces for like um character or rather character um uh like the covers for each update you know i'll put something that just feels kind of like it hits on the, the theme of the update and that's that's where it goes but i need proper concept art in order for people to to be on board with the project um and it's also one of those weird places where, yeah, it's super expensive to do that. So you kind of have to make two with uh, with what you can, but um, be very aware of the the stance that people have on AI generated art. And I'm sure it will evolve and that that landscape is going to constantly be changing. But for the the time being, it's it's not if you can afford otherwise, don't use AI generated art. Yeah, it's definitely, um, Paco saying that uh, without consensus on how it should be used, AI art remains. Um, uh, there's like an icon over my, whatever. Um, the, like an IP wild west of sorts. And yeah, it's, it's definitely in a weird place. I hope that it, I hope that we figure out how to, work with it opposed to having this sort of standoff standoffish relationship um with it because a lot of the artists that i know and i know everybody doesn't feel this way but a lot of the artists that i know from working in the games industry they view it as a tool that can expedite their their workflow because there's a lot of stuff that it just doesn't make sense for human hands to be you know making the same thing you know a hundred times that's not where the that's not where the passion and creativity come in. That's just the tedium um, that uh, that doesn't need to to exist. And I think that if we can kind of bring a little bit more uh, uh, nuance to the conversation, which is very difficult to have online, because trying to trying to have any sort of normal conversation online just doesn't work well uh, nowadays. But uh, hopefully, we can work through our problems. Yeah, whatever. That's that's all I'll say. Okay, so if we go back to uh testing. Oh, actually, okay. So commission art, um just real quick, a few places that you can do this are um fiverr.com. Also be very aware of AI art um on that website. A lot of people are selling it right now. And you need to you need to learn what the signs are because it's very very easy 
to tell when something is AI. Um, but there are actually, but there are also really good ways to mask that something is AI. But I think that most of the people selling on Fiverr don't do that. So look at their portfolio and, um, and also see where they're coming from. Because if you, if you see like a, a price tag that's like super low, you're like, oh, wow, yeah, no, that's a really good art for this price. Uh, like you one, try to figure out if it's AI. And then two, that's likely not coming from the U.S. Because people's price tags in the U.S. are stupid. Well, I, I say stupid, but stupid high compared to the rest of the world. And it, But it's for good reason. Like I totally expect to pay upwards of 500 bucks for just a, a singular um, full body shot of a uh, of character art because that's I mean key art in Planetside 2 when we did the, the loading screens that's ten thousand dollars every single one so we have to make sure that whatever we put out is something that we're going to be able to reuse the pieces of for advertising uh, material for uh, you know loading screens just so that we can get some use out of it for um, uh, even just to like better the relationship with our, the people that we're working with, you know, those uh, outsourcing houses. So be very intentional about the, um, about what you're, you're trying to create. Don't just gun it, like swing it from the hip. Uh, I'll, I'll probably, once I get more experience contracting commission art on my own, I would love to do an, a video about this because I have a lot of experience within the games industry, but very little experience when it comes to actually getting that art commissioned for my, my own projects. Uh, let's see, artists submitting their works to a sort of AI library for AI. Sample is a big concept. Yeah. Uh, for royalty purposes, credit and reimbursement. Yeah, you have to... Um... Oh, take it easy, uh, Bulk, if you if you haven't left already. Thanks for, for hanging out. Uh, I've been a player off and off since 2015. Hey, thanks. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, 10000 for the key art is on the low end of what a studio, a like a, an established studio that does good art is is willing to pay. Like this is, it's not necessarily the friends and family deal, but but we, we had it good for, for a while. And I am pretty sure that they'd be charging more than that now. Oh, that's interesting, Owen. I, I wouldn't, I want to talk to you later about that particular experience because yeah, because I'm still learning about this whole concept too. That does seem wicked, wicked low. All right, uh, let's move on. Do, do, do Fiverr, um, and then like you can look on Art Station for uh, you know freelance artists, um, and if you have a small studio for your, yourself, which. Maybe, maybe you do, I don't know. Um, then you can find people for a contract uh, as well. That's a whole thing. Okay, so let's move down to, to the testing of the game. First thing, this should happen throughout the entire process. Entire process. You will never have a good idea that stays the only idea. You will have, hopefully, many good ideas and probably way more bad ideas. That is how development of anything should go. Because what you're trying to do when you develop something is you're putting something um, in front of other people. And ideally, you've used all of your time and uh, experiences in the world to inform your decisions. But your perspective is not everybody's perspective. And when it comes to serving an audience, what they... Uh, how they interpret things that you offer them matters a lot. And the only way that you get that sort of feedback is by testing. Here's where, so, okay. Um, internal testing. Friends and family. Make them <laughs> play with you. This is, the, this is the main one that I've had uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of time like we, we've, we've play tested this game for months. Um, we've been doing weekly sessions and it's been difficult in December and November, but actually on Monday, 
we're going to record another uh, live stream, uh, rather an actual play for this game and be the players who we introduced uh, a couple of weeks ago in the character creation live stream. They're going to be playing, but they're going to be playing a different version of the game because I don't stop. <laughs> I just want to keep um, going and going and going. Uh, so they're going to be playtesting some like live changes and hopefully it works out well. That's, that's all that I can say. Uh, but, uh, and this is also, you know, community, uh, testing times are important. I feel like I'm not there yet, uh, mostly because it's very difficult for me to, it's difficult for me to find people who are willing to test on their own because, you know, I'm just some nobody just making stuff on my own. Uh, there's a little bit of a following, like many of you here know who I am and, and, and what I've done and are, and thank you so much for like being here and supportive and, and that is super, super helpful. But a lot of people won't even have that either. So it's, it can be difficult to find people to, to test your game. And I feel like you might be able to do it if you, uh, there's a website called, I think it's start playing here. Hold on just a second. I'm going to, let me check. Uh, start playing games, start playing dot games. So I, I fully have not, um, investigated this route, but if you are looking for play testers, uh, I've seen, I've, I've browsed the site before and I've seen people posting up games that are, Hey, if you want to like come learn a new system and then they'll create a, a slot for other people to sign up for the, so that's, if you want to like find people on the internet, it's very scary, uh, that you're going to sit down with and then play games with them and then talk them through the process and try to get them on board. Yeah. Paco, like the, the, from nothing problem. Absolutely. It takes awareness to, it's like a, it, it takes money to make money sort of situation. Um, so it can definitely be difficult Let's find, find games. Just as an example, I'm going to see if I can find one for, oh my goodness, uh, this one over here. Let's see. Um, I don't know, like you'll see, you know, these people are running games. They have specific seats. It tells you uh, how they're communicating, what, you know, what they're using. And then you can make money from doing this too. Uh, which I should, I should probably look at doing maybe, but I wouldn't be able to do that with a new game. Like I'd have to teach people how to play the new game. Right. So, uh, this is, yeah, and you can host, you can host free games as well. Like everything up here is a price tag, but it doesn't need to be. So that's one route and I'll, um, put the start playing dot games in the, up here too. Uh, another uh, testing is just like organize the discord, you know, if you can build a, a community, which we'll, we'll talk about in a later step. Uh, Owen says being a part of several, uh, being a part of several discord servers where players are starved for playing is also a big bonus. That sounds, that makes sense. Um, let's see, catching up on chat. I homebrew a lot for D&D, &D, so it takes uh, so much effort to get people in my circles to try things out. Uh, but that may have more to do with how we have few interruptions to the campaigns we play. Yeah, uh, I don't I don't think this is a, a problem that is unfamiliar to, to people. It's scheduling is hard, you know, and it's very difficult. One thing that you'll you run into too, just for a new system, is that even if your game, if even if your game is like, oh, it's D and D, but this is like a way that, or, but it's it's different. And here's the ways that it's different. People might not care. Uh, you know, it's it's difficult to to get people to move over to a different game because it involves learning a bunch of stuff. It involves uh, having other people to play, which people are scarce. So and the playtimes are scarce. And then 
there's a there's like a cost to it when you're actually sitting there playing the game. Is it going to be fun? Or should I fall back on the thing that I know is going to be fun? So there's friction when it comes to, to creating a new game in general. And overcoming that friction is probably going to be the most difficult challenge that you'll face when trying to design um, the, a new game from scratch. Okay, so a trajectory. Uh, hey, Koki. Talking about playtesting? Yeah, I was just talking about um, teaching, or rather, so the whole chat's about like building your own TTRPG, and this one in particular is uh, is how you find testers. Uh, and if you have any good ideas for for doing that, totally feel free to uh, to dump it in the chat. But that's it's just a difficulty that you will um, actually. I'm gonna go back to this one. Um, it's a difficulty that you will face when developing anything. And again, testing should ha should happen throughout the entire process. Um, I'll say even ideally, before you release a new version, it should probably be thoroughly tested. This is something that I have difficulty with because I like to create and I see things that are a problem and I want to fix the problem. But there's also, and this is after you have people who are like willing to test consistently. There's also an issue with um, keeping something stagnant for, for too long. Rather, you, you want to be able to let it simmer so that uh, people can get comfortable. One D&D, &D, they release a new test packet well, it's been a little sporadic lately, but it was like every 10 weeks or something like that. Uh, you know, going into 2024, they're going to release a new game. It'll be the 50th anniversary of Dungeons and Dragons in general. I'm sure we'll have lots to talk about. But uh, they were conducting, uh, they're releasing test packets through a system they, they called Unearth Arcana, which is just like they say, hey, here's a test packet. These are a bunch of new things. That, or like new changes or additions or whatever, um, go play test it. The thing is that they don't really have, they don't really, I don't want to say they don't care. There's not a whole lot of time for you to actually play test those things because it's very difficult to get a game together. And then like you might have one, like a, a one-off experience, but that might not be everybody's experience. That might not be the experience that you have after playing it the second time. So they have to rely on just like so many people testing, um, uh, just, you know, doing as much testing as they possibly can within a short amount of time. And then what they do is they have uh, feedback forms. So this is super important. Um, I don't have any consistent testing, so I don't do this yet, but I will need to. And I think um, the next version, I'm going to start doing this. But uh, feedback forms are uh, good unbiased, I shouldn't say unbiased, um, good way to gather feedback without uh, needing to be in a public forum. So when you're in a public space, uh, Reddit, forums, Twitter, Discord, whatever, people are always going to have a so they're seeing what other people are are writing if they have a contrary opinion that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to speak it uh, and also people tend to talk about things that they either don't like um, than the things that they they feel good about and then people who are content kind of like good with everything overall may not feel the need to speak up so what you can do to help circumvent that is by sending a feedback form that answers, uh, gives very specific questions. So you need to know what you want people to test. I should probably put that earlier. And then you should uh, make sure to ask people questions that will give you good data and that isn't going to push them one way or the other. So when you're asking specific questions, one thing that you want to do is um, shuffle the questions. Uh, give a rating scale that doesn't. Uh, so give it give a rating scale that um, uses impartial language. So one way to do that is like. Um, 
So if you say like, uh, I can't think of a bad example, but there's plenty out there. You just have to be very careful about the, the language that you're using when phrasing questions and then giving them a rating scale. It says like, how satisfied uh, are you with this particular feature? Like not very satisfied, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, somewhat dissatisfied, uh, you know, maybe a neutral or something like that. That is an easier way to kind of uh, see where the pin is, you know, stuck in that particular topic than saying something like, like, what, what didn't you like about this thing? Because that assumes then that somebody doesn't like something. And then I'm not giving great examples, but I hopefully you get the point. Uh, see, so Marco says, if you have group leaders, you can really quickly have thought leaders um, that lead dialogue. Yes, absolutely. It's, um, I think ringleaders is probably a better word where some people can push their opinions so much or just speak them really often and even without any malicious intent to where it flavors the rest of the conversation. Because again, anytime that you have a dissenting opinion, there is friction with which to, to voice it. You can try to, um, you can try to create a space where there's like no bad ideas. Um, and that can help. It can also be a little, it can be a little bit crazy too, if you kind of go that direction. So it's much easier to ask people specifically what you're trying to get from their feedback and then invite them to, to speak on those things. Um, yeah. So feedback, iterate, improve, do it again. Trajectory. Oh, uh, yeah. So VTS says, um, uh, Google forms is that's what I would use too. This is, it has, um, it has like an auto shuffle feature for like multiple choice questions, which is helpful too, because people will gravitate toward like the top answer. <laughs> so you want to change the top answer. Um, especially, oh, and another thing is, uh, Keep your feedback forms as short as you can because uh, feedback fatigue is a thing. If you have ever gone through um, a feedback form and then just been like, you know, you're answering your questions, you're writing out dialogue, and then it just keeps going way longer than you expect it to. So at that point, you either just stop giving feedback altogether or you speed through the process. I just like, yeah, okay, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm done with that at this point. So uh, I think, well, yeah, that's all I need to, to talk about there. Uh, let's see, Marco says, I find satisfied always a weird description of their feeling. Yeah, um, I go with hate it slash love it. Okay, that's... I think that's totally fair. I think you, you arrive at the same result, but I, I agree that satisfied sounds a little bit more sterile and, um, and inviting emotion is probably a fun way to, to approach that. You just have to be sure that it's, it feels like as unbiased as you can, you can make it. So like, you know, that there's no wrong answers. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Oh man, uh, Paco says, I'm about to wrap up a two and a half year long campaign and my feedback form is going to be no longer than one page. Nice. Very good. Uh, I remember you using, uh, Woodrick says, I remember you using feedback forms during Sh Shatter Warp Gate. Yes. Um, we've done, we've done a fair amount of feedback forms throughout and they're actually super helpful. I still have them. They're, I shouldn't, okay. I shouldn't, I'm going to say it anyway. Um, like I made all those feedback forms, so I have the results <laughs> sitting in my my uh, Google uh, whatever whatever, and I can I can see the things that people you know like didn't like and that sort of thing is very important to me. So, um, let's see, yes, avoid odd numbered question to stop anyone picking in the middle. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's jump back into it. Trajectory. So this one I wanted to, to touch on a little bit. And what it comes down to is asking yourself, are you meeting your goals? Simple. Are you meeting your goals? So that's um, monetarily, uh, timeline. Are you actually targeting the market that you set out to target? Like you might have an idea for like, oh yeah, no, these, these are the players that I'm going to cater to. And then you, you structure the game in such a way that it's like, like, we don't like that, you know, <laughs> and then you, then you need to rethink. So are you moving in the right direction? And it's okay to have setbacks because that's probably going to happen. But what you have to be is, um, be honest with yourself about your failings. Um, to, and to give people some credit uh, and your successes. This is something that uh, I have historically had a hard time with because it's it's very easy to um, to focus too much on the on what you're doing right or focus too much on what you're doing wrong and not be able to to balance the two. So taking a more like, I guess, stoic sort of logical look at what you're actually creating and where it's going, uh, which includes things like, so for example, just to speak from my own experience, I have about maybe about two months left at most before I need to re-enter the games industry or some other industry. I This, this game is, or this uh, development is a pet project that I've now spent, what, six to eight months or something like that um, developing. So I will just run out of money and need to, because uh, this this is all free, it's, you know, whatever. Um, and outside of you know, people just, uh, you know, chipping in as much as they, uh, they feel they can, this is just a passion project. So, knowing that, knowing that like, you know, I'm putting out YouTube videos and they're not getting as many views as I was um, hoping for, or knowing that, um, you know, we have this discord channel and the, the influx of players really slowed down past the first month, like those sorts of things. You, you can't make something on hopes and prayers. You have to be very, uh, kind of cold and calculating when it comes to what you're actually going to be able to accomplish and where you're going to end up if you fail. So uh, that's the biggest point here. This is more like a um, something to to check yourself on. And actually, I think we kind of went over these two points. I don't really need to talk about that. All right, so that's the, the developing side of things. Uh, oh, take it easy, Paco. Thanks for hanging out. Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, streams available later. Uh, yes, Owen, it'll be on. Uh, it'll be on the VOD. No worries. Thank you so much for hanging out. Okay, so let's move down to uh, communicating. We talked a little bit about this earlier, and again, all of these things are happening like at the same time and then multiple times over, oh, except for maybe shipping. But also, <laughs> we'll talk about it. Okay, so uh, where do you find your audience? Is it like Twitter following, question mark? Do you have an email list? Yep, list. Uh, are you, um, like, do you have a Discord server? How are you going to find people to play the game? Is it um, Reddit? Is it uh, startplaying.games? If that's the actual website. Um, are you reaching out to content creators? 
this is this is an important one. I've actually done this a um, a number of times so far, and it is so I I've contacted um, a handful of different people, and I did that with my first alpha. I'm like, bam, look at this, 120 pages. It's totally free, and uh. And then a lot of the content creators were like, I don't have time to look at that, <laughs> please. Um, but they were also very gracious about it. So here's an, here's a, um, I guess, a note that you can take to the bank. Rules light systems with quick start guides are way better to present people than a rules heavy 120 plus page um, document. Yeah, it was, <laughs> oh man. Um, like I said, they were gracious, but, um, but also there was so much jacked up in that first version of the document. I thought it was, so, okay. I'm gonna go back to formatting real quick. Uh, developing, testing. I'm going to put this point. You know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it down in, in shipping. So, mm, okay, we'll, we'll put it here. So you're not done yet, but you want to show it off. This is a section now. Um, Format of the document. Are you using? So when it comes to early, okay. How are you formatting the document? Okay. So when it comes to a digital uh, offering, one page is good. I started with two pages because I was like, this is how it's going to look in the book. And, you know, it's two page spread, really annoying to, to thumb through in a PDF viewer. It's like, yeah, there's a reason that people don't do that. So don't do that. Um, another thing is like your fonts. Um, is it, is it read readable? And this is probably more development stuff. I can, I could go into like the needly nitty gritty all day long, but are your fonts readable? Are your colors readable? The first um, document that I put out had like a, a maroon color in it. And I lined it up in Photoshop after talking to somebody else about it. And it's like, if you have um, Deruder, uh, Proton Protonopia, Deuteronopia, is that how you pronounce it? Color blindness. You can't read those fonts or like they were on a backing that had a particular type of color, you can't read it. So I think it's like, what is it like 10% of people are colorblind or something like that? Or do you, do you say colorblindness anymore? I don't know the appropriate um, way to, to speak on this particular subject. Uh, but I think that's like 10% of the population. Um, I, I can't remember where I'm getting that statistic from though. So it could be totally wrong. But if, that's a part of your audience. Like, yes, make the document readable, question mark. So there's like, so I, you know, later went in, changed some colors. And there's something to be said about, you know, artistic jurisdiction because I, I like color. I really like color. And I feel like a lot of the books that you, you read are kind of just boring. So I had to kind of, uh, I had to reconcile those two things. And maybe it's fine now. I'm, I'm not actually sure, but uh, but I focused on having like you know high contrast headers. Um, the font was very very important. You can spend hours trying to find a font in Adobe. I'm gonna put that back up here. So developing man, all this stuff needs to be turned into like hideable drop downs because it's too much. Um, testing man, okay. I'm gonna say uh. Adobe fonts. Um, 
Ja. Publishing software. Let's, why don't we do... Uh, ah, oh man, what's happening? Okay. Uh, formatting. It's probably okay. So Adobe fonts for the fonts. Um, and uh, use... Photoshop has a... Color, I'm still going to call it color blindness for the sake of this, and I apologize to anybody out here um, who, like, if that's not an appropriate term, please let me know. I would love to be uh, better informed. Uh, so Photoshop has a color blindness filter. I think they actually call it a color blindness filter, though, uh, that you can check to make sure that your document is readable. Um, so those are just some notes. There's so much. Uh, oh, I'm going to go back to the, the formatting thing. Uh, let's see. Is it printable? You want a, a document that can be printed, or at the very least, character sheets that can be printed. And in order to, to encourage people to print it, that means you got to get rid of all the crap. So... Um, Uh, you don't need, don't need fancy, uh, headers for an alpha. You know, you don't need, um, a bunch of, uh, embellishments and you know, that sort of thing. Okay. Anyway, you get the point. Okay. So reaching out to content creators, um, and I'll say here too, I know I'm jumping around a whole lot, but it's like, how my brain works. Um, let's see. Uh, the, in order to reach out to content creators, if you go to the YouTube pages, uh, you can find their business email. Uh, here's how I would say that etiquette should go. Ask if you can or ask if they would have an interest in what you're uh, doing, what you're creating. You do not be pushy. Your product doesn't ma doesn't matter. Keep those two things in mind. And having been like a content creator that was constantly just pelted with stuff like, yeah, yeah, we're, we're making this game and you should promote it. And it, it was obnoxious, especially when people think that they can do something for you that you don't need. Like they'll say that, um, uh, they'll offer you some sort of service. Like I actually, I just got offered one the other day. Um, for like doing S, uh, SEO on my, my YouTube page or whatever. Like, I don't like, and they, they were saying that, oh, you know, the, the SEO is really bad because, you know, you, you're putting out a video, your views drop drastically, but there was no, like they were just selling themselves. And for me, it's like, I haven't touched this channel in five years. I am pivoting to a totally different topic. Of course, my views are low. Is that, so it's like those sorts of things. Don't think that you um, know more than somebody else. Don't think that you uh, have the right to get somebody's uh, feedback on something. Just be genuine and ask if you can give them something. Like offer, be generous. You know, they ultimately they're doing you a favor just by looking at it. You know, at the very least, uh, something to think about is like if your name crosses their desk, like that's, that's also a win. So, um, yeah, uh, I feel like I have more on this in particular, but I think it kind of just comes back to like rules light. Be, um, be aware of their time constraints. Oh, you know what? So know who you're talking to or rather know who 
know what uh, content they cover. It's it's always good to to make sure. Like I, when I was building a um, a list of actually that's another thing. Like you know, uh, I guess I'll start up here. Build a list of potential content creators, people that you can reach out to. So when I was developing the project, I was learning more about who exists within the TTRPG space and what things they cover and what their subscriber count is and whether or not they would be a good fit for me to send information to. Um, I had a list of like 30 different people. I have only reached out to a handful of them and not even like the biggest names. And the reason for it is that I want to make sure that you need to, or I, I want to make sure that you, um, that I have something that, that is actually worthy of their time. And it's good to test the waters to get a feeling for things. And then this is something that you can do, which um, admittedly I haven't done yet, but it is, it is totally legit. Um, do this whenever it makes sense. Uh, use your previous contacts uh, as a as evidence of your legitimacy. So if I say, uh, if I say that, um, you know, I send somebody an email and I say that, uh, hey, would you like to take a look at um, my my RPG? Uh, you know, Dice Breakers took a look at it and this is their article, you know, for it. Or maybe I'm like, you know, you know, Kotaku or whatever, uh, you know, wrote an article about it here. You can you know, read up on it. A little bit tricky though, because um, here, here's the, the catch is that if you uh, add links to your email, it might end up in a spam filter. So just ask people first and then... Uh, and then you can kind of point to a couple of, of articles or references that you've had to kind of build your legitimacy, but capitalize on that previous experience and keep trading it in, like trade it up for, for better things. I'm not there yet, but this is a, a valid strategy that a lot of people use. Um, and I, it's, it's just reputation um, based, you know, you get some social currency for, for doing that. Okay, let me fall back on the chat. Let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Okay, the font needs to be uh, hoo, 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 uh, says the font needs to be uh, tuned to set um, do, 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 do. Oh, I'd recommend watching the, the real life monk made print tables. Okay, well, okay. So actually, you, you bring up a, a good point, but I'm wondering if it's for the right reasons. So when you're thinking about a font for your project, it the very first thing that it needs to be is readable. You're trying to deliver information. The second thing is that you can find fonts that speak to the themes of your game. Um, I think that Pendragon, I'll, I'll look this up real quick. Um, Pendragon TTRPG, let's see if I can find. Uh, let's see if I can find a, a document. Um, okay, cool. So, blah. Uh, hold on just a moment. Okay, so check this out. So this is uh, Pendragon. And if you look at their font, uh, font, it all, okay. I said, make it readable. This is, this is borderline for me, but um, if you look at their headers, because that's that's the place that you can most easily express yourself because the uh, the letters are larger. It's meant to feel medieval. Um, yeah, so like it, it gets their their theme across. I guess it's not it's not egregious uh, in the readability. But I, I would say for an alpha document, don't even, 
don't worry about that yet unless you have like art to go along with it, unless you're further along in the process, I guess. Cool. Uh, let's see, what else? Let's see, I really think uh, you need an extreme quick start setup to the point where there are pre-made character sheets that offer classical fantasy uh, classes roles. That's a really good point, Marco. Um, so I, I think, I mean, it depends on what type of game you're trying to release, right? But the, the pre-made character sheets is super helpful. Quick start guide, super helpful. I hear that. Um, I hear that a lot and I have a really difficult time. I'm doing pre-made characters easy, uh, especially since I have a fillable PDF and I can just like do that. Right. But finding ways to cull information into what is strictly necessary, that is a really, really difficult task. It is so much more difficult to, uh, to cut away from a large project than it is to just add more. Because I feel like it's, it's easy to get caught up in thinking what rules you need when the perspective that you should really try to be taking on a quick start guide from is uh, I guess, how, how do people start playing? Like that's, that's the introduction. It's not, they don't need to know everything about the game. They just need to, to be able to start rolling dice. You know, they need to be able to, to know what things on their character sheet, uh, make the game go and that's it. So if you can capture that with the, with a limited rule set while also getting your theme, uh, and the goals of your game across, that's pretty much it. But again, that's something that I struggle with. I'm going to need to buckle down and focus on it at some point, but um, I don't think I'm there yet. Uh, let's see. Okay. We are going to uh, to move on. I'm going to try to make it to the, the end. It's, uh, I think we're an hour and a half in at this point. Um, let's see. So, when it comes to, oh, I guess we're back at, uh, so talked about reaching out to content creators. Again, don't be a douche. I'm telling you, don't be a douche. <laughs> um, the other thing is, how do you build excitement? This comes back to why should people care? Um, which also is, what problems are you solving? A lot of this is is cyclical. You have to keep asking yourself, these questions and then try to get people to to feel uh, what you're trying to to offer them and uh, you know find something that they can latch on to find a concept that is easy to explain it is oh man it is really uh, so if you're a creative person um, a lot of people can get up their own butt about the things that they're developing like, oh yeah, this is so cool because of X, Y, and Z and there's nothing like it. And, uh, and this is why it's so good. And, and like everyone else is wrong. Can't do that. You, so first off, that's a, it'll, it'll push people away. You're not going to convince them that, oh, I should, I shouldn't say that because again, you can do the, the salesman marketing stuff. And like a lot of people fall for that. Um, but try to be, try to figure out how you can actually help somebody, you know, catering to the, the games that they want to play. Also, you don't need to convince everybody that your project is for them. If anything, you should be trying to convince people that, uh, or rather trying to, to help them figure out whether the thing that you're working on is something that makes sense for their table is something that they would be interested in and then make it very clear when you are making something that is not in that vein, because especially if you bring people on and start building a community, you're going to have a lot of, um, uh, opinions, you know, people who have the, their feedback, they have their own perspectives, different experiences, and what they may want out of your game is going to be different than what the, the goals for your game are. And, a lot of it is well-intentioned, 
but uh, you need to learn how to create those boundaries, which I think starts with just setting out the very explicit goals for what your game is trying to achieve, which I don't even think we covered from from the planning set uh, stage. Like there's some some stuff in here, but this is this is super loose when it comes down to the actual um, like developing and designing the the goals for your game and the unique selling points. Uh, you know how it stands out from another system, like um, one of the other uh, viewers was saying. You know that question that they asked me is one that you should be asking yourself. Uh, how does your game differentiate from another product that's similar? Okay, um, and then build the act of building excitement is. This relies a lot on just how much reach you have, and the only way that I can. The only way that I can confidently speak on this particular topic uh, or like give some confident 100% advice is you have to invest yourself in those communities. Go to, um, uh, we're jumping around from this list. These, these conversations are just, they're off the rails. Uh, go to uh, reddit.com slash r slash RPG. That's where a lot of the RPG conversation is happening. Um, go to, uh, <clears throat> I think there's like a, I don't go here. I, I'm not that familiar yet, but there's like EN World is one that I hear a lot that people use. Uh, go there. Go to um, like comment on other YouTubers channels. Uh, join discords for uh, TTRPG development. Um, MCDM has a whole, like, they have a channel that's dedicated specifically to just, like, talking about RPG or TTRPG-related design. Um, another Discord that I'm a part of, uh, JFace's uh, Discord, and he's also trying to create his own system. He His whole Discord is meant for people to, like, talk to each other and help each other with design problems and that sort of thing. <clears throat> Excuse me. These are the sorts of spaces that you need to invest yourself in because you need to become uh, knowledgeable about the thing that you are trying to create. You want to create inroads with the particular community, which means that they need to know your name. Um, and then you ideally you're able to create some smaller past works, which I think one, here, I'm gonna just put this right up at top. Uh, start small. This is a really important one that um, I totally don't adhere to, so enjoy that. Uh, and then the last one, actually, are you testing? This is where, this is also how, how some of you, or how you build some excitement which is the, the playing of the game. Play the game. Show the game. Show the game. Play the game. All right, last thing that we're going to cover, because it's getting late. Um, so, yeah, so shipping. So you're not done yet, but you want to show it off. This is the um, question mark, question mark, question mark profit uh, part, because I haven't done it. So take anything that I say with a grain of salt. But uh, so if you're not done, you want to show it off, you need to think about um, alpha, which is usually uh, design is heavily in flux. Don't ever think that you have the design the moment that you set out to create it. Just keep iterating. Um, beta is a stage where it's mostly complete, but needs uh, tuning and, and probably art as well and then uh shipping or i guess uh what do you call it i guess just release is the the final product that's that's the one that you're actually sending to to people so during the alpha stage that's where you generate ideas that's where you can continue to to iterate in what feels mostly like a pressure free area um, beta is, you don't want a whole lot to change uh, at that point. You should have already figured out the design 
and you're trying to now execute on it in a way that is going to get the most people excited. And then the release is do or die. Uh, raising money, difficult. Um, most of the time, you will be paying out of pocket. Unfortunately, it doesn't take much to create a TTRPG. It's Google Docs. That's it. Um, you know, or Google Sheets and uh, Canva. It's all free. However, if you're trying to do this for a living, don't start where I start. Um, I had a safety net, or rather, like I had money from the last job, and I knew that I was going to wear it down, and that I'm going to get to the point where I'm not going to be able to, um, you're not going to be able to do this anymore. And I know that because I know where I'm going to end up. Um, so make sure that I guess you have a, a safety net. Know where you're going to you're going to land um, if you fail, or if things take too long, or if you don't raise the money that uh, you think you're going to raise along the way. Uh, one way that you can try to raise money is that Patreon is a good platform for this sort of thing. Um, but you kind of have to already have a following. And I'm going to try to open uh, Patreon again, very likely. But I don't I don't know what the results are going to be because it's it's way better to uh, oh, thank you, DJ. Um, it's way better to create things that you're giving to people rather than, than asking them to be invested in this thing that they may not have a connection to. So the thing that I'm scared about with doing Patreon is that, um, most of my focus is on distal, you know, the TTRPG that I'm creating, but that's not the thing that people care about paying for. Uh, the Patreon that I run or had run in the past, back when I was doing YouTube full time, it it was very much people trying to support me and trying to support my ability to to share with the world, which is it's they were kind enough to help help me give to others, and that is a very different feeling than hey support my pet project. So I can't speak. Um, I can't like use Patreon as a, as a surefire thing, but what you can do is uh, release smaller projects to itch.io um, or release smaller projects to uh, drive through RPG. Uh, yeah, so those, it just comes from like building smaller projects which again, start small. Don't do what I'm doing. Um, it's not a good idea. Sales channels. Uh, so actually selling the game, this would come through. Uh, if So DC20 is using their Shopify um, account to sell alpha access, which I think is working out for him. Uh, I don't feel comfortable doing that, but I can't. I also like look at the success and I'm saying like, man, maybe I should have been doing that. You know, are people willing to pay for this sort of thing? But again, he has, he has like a track record of putting out a whole bunch of homebrew um, D and D content. So he already kind of has a following, but uh, so Shopify can integrate uh, easily into YouTube. And for the first few months, it's, it's pretty close to free. It's like a dollar for the first three months. But, um, but it's more after that. It's also a pain in the butt. So if you're not adept at dealing with this sort of stuff, then uh, I wouldn't really pursue it. Uh, backer kit. Actually, these two are <laughs> these two are actually sales channels. Um, so I'm going to move them down here. Backer kit and Kickstarter. I'm just going to put them both in the same line. Uh, are for uh helping fund projects so that you can bring them to completion but that requires people to care so you already have to have a following and then the delivery i don't know um that's where well i see i see delivery i think this was actually meant for like how do you make something that's satisfying to people 
this I'm not going to speak on because I don't have any uh, any experience and I also haven't seen how the sausage is made in that particular uh, topic. Ooh. All right, let's go back to, to chat real quick. Hey, y'all. Um, uh, trying to parse through some of it. So Mark was saying that uh, it'd also be good for experienced players oh, in regards to the, the pre-made stuff in the quick start guide, just to see what is possible and where the focus could be put on and what interesting elements are. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Um, uh, do, 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 do. Uh, who, 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 who is talking about uh, a game that they have in mind. Oh, interesting. Yeah, it seems like fun. Uh, let's see. Yes. Um, so hi DJ. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm trying to, to do, you know, the indie dev thing in, in some respect. So, um, I hope that, I hope that like the streams and the videos and that sort of thing are, are helpful to some degree. And, uh, and like Marco said, yeah, every Friday at 8 PM Eastern time is a stream uh, based on some of the responses that I see uh, or have seen in chat, it seems like a little bit too late for people. So maybe, I don't know, I, I guess we'll have, still have to kind of play it by ear. But thank you all for for hanging out. Um, I'm glad to get some of those thoughts out kind of into the, the wild. I know it was really rambly. I think that at some point it would be nice to to do like a proper video on this stuff. But as you can see, like there's so much here that it is, it would need to be broken down, I think, into um, into different areas. And a lot of the stuff I'm still working through. I've done a lot of the very technical stuff, uh, you know, like doing all this, this sort of uh, thing with the word processors and publishing software and character sheets and art and that sort of thing. Like I, I've been doing that kind of for a long time, just off and on with my own projects and the, the jobs that I've um kind of had in my my life uh, thus far. So I have some prior knowledge that helps lend itself. And, um, but like a, a lot of the stuff is stuff I'm still exploring. So at the end of the day, take this conversation with a grain of salt. And, uh, and I still hope that it's helpful from the perspective of somebody who's trying to like work through it all. All right. Yeah, more appropriate for a series than one long video. I totally agree. Uh, I've been working on making D and D classes and I'm making mod for oh BG three. Awesome, that's fun. Uh, cool. Alrighty, everybody, thank you so much for hanging out. And I think that is uh, about where we're going to call it for today or tonight or to morning whatever the case is. And uh, I'll catch you all later.